Well, ladies and gentlemen, we are ready to begin uh, panel two. As uh, uh, Paul Somerville mentioned uh, in his uh, opening remarks, uh, the role of distributed energy resources is clearly going to be more, not less important as we head into the uh, immediate uh, and not too distant future. So to lead us ably in this uh, next panel, uh, let me turn the show over to Robert Warren, known to many of you as a longtime energy guru. Robert? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Sean. Um, with your indulgence, I'm going to begin with a brief personal anecdote. Um, Paul and uh, Richard have organized uh, a serious conference dealing with serious issues, and surprisingly or not, uh, I've been giving those issues a lot of thought. I get on the subway this morning at Union Station, uh, still deep in thought about these issues. A, an extraordinarily garrulous, talkative man sits down opposite me, discovers almost immediately that I'm a lawyer, and in the course of four stops, covers the following topics. One, how can I fake a whiplash? <laughs> Two, how can I get out of jury duty? Three, tells me a lawyer's joke, never positive, and then as I'm getting up to leave, he says, do you know that most people hate lawyers? <laughs> and I said, uh, I wasn't aware of that, but my name is George Vig, and here are my contacts. <laughs> um, the, uh, I want to introduce the issue of rate making by reference to an article that appeared last week in The Globe. Conrad Yakubuski was writing about the long-term or the trailing implications of the fair uh, hydro plan. And he was saying that, using the example that in 2028, if you wanted to uh, avoid the balloon, uh, you'd have to be in a remote area. I think he used the example of Algonquin Park and off the grid. Now, intentionally or otherwise, uh, Conrad Yakubuski raised two issues which are relevant, A, to this conference, and B, to the next panel. 2028 assumes that the technology will be at such a level of sophistication and so low a cost that it will be accessible to essentially anybody. But if you want to be off the grid, it assumes that you're going to somehow avoid the trailing obligations, the concern about stranded assets, the concern about social equity, issues which are deeply relevant to the question of how you pay for, how you protect the system while you encourage DER implementation. We have a three and a fourth about to arrive excellent speakers who will talk about that. And we'll begin with Ira Chabelle, who will talk about broadly some of the policy issues and the way those policy issues have been addressed in uh, other jurisdictions. Uh, we will then turn to two representatives of LDCs, the, I think now, number one and two in Ontario in terms of size, uh, who are responsible for implementing, dealing with, wrestling with the complex issues of how you deal with rates in a circumstance where DER is being implemented. Ira? Thank you very much, Robert. And uh, thanks to Paul and Richard for inviting me and to Moat. Uh, pleasure to be here. I wanted to actually start with uh, the, the last thing that Joe said. He said it's going to be up to markets uh, to, 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 for the evolution of the system and, and choices. I think it's going to also be up to rates, uh, the way rates incent individual actions. And I think we've seen that. We've seen that in Ontario. We've seen it, um, if, for example, in California, the very high rates and then the very high last block of residential rates, so that rates get very high for that last block. Uh, people in California that have appropriate roofs find it very attractive to put solar on the roof, net meter, and just, just avoid that block. And so I think it's, it's rates as well as economics as the, the economics get translated to rates. 
Well, I, since 2006 or so, uh, Ontario has uh, reduced its carbon footprint, footprint dramatically. At the same time, uh, electricity demand has been virtually flat and slightly declining. The 2007 cessation of coal use regulation resulted in, as was mentioned earlier, a replacement of all the coal generation, all the coal capacity operating in Ontario with natural gas combined cycle mostly under contract, under 20, typically 20-year 20 contracts that are still in effect that don't roll off until, start rolling off until about 2023. At the same time, the Green Energy Act of 2009 resulted in uh, the fit contracts and uh, a great deal of wind, so central station wind, and also a significant amount of um, small rooftop solar, small wind, and other resources, uh, and a great deal of decarbonization, about 80 percent, which is laudable, in the electric sector since 2000 since 2005 or six per time frame. Uh, at the same time, part of, that, part of that shift has resulted in higher cost to customers. The contracts and the fit contracts, the microfit contracts are paid for through the, uh, the general adjustment. And that's roughly doubled the energy portion of customers' rates between the same time period, 2006, 2005, 6 to now. So now if you actually looked at the wholesale price, the hope, it's quite low, but the, the global adjustment is quite high. And the combination is roughly doubled. And that's resulting in great pain for many consumers. And it also produces incentives for individuals to, to install their own Dura systems and commercial and, and resident commercial and industrials to do the same. So there's about 4,200 megawatts of what a, what a distributed called distributed energy DURS, of which about 2,300 megawatts is solar, 600 is wind, 400 or so is DR, and then there's some hydro and other things that constitute the rest. And that's likely to continue. Customer preferences are encouraging DERS. The cost of especially solar has come down dramatically. And also the microfit contracts, which started off a rooftop solar, believe in the range of 80 cents a kilowatt hour. It's now in the range of 31 cents. It's still a very insignificant incentive to, to uh, install distributed resources. So that starts to talk about the, the rate issue or the rate question. That kind of structure supports and encourages customers to take action to avoid those uh, very high costs. If they have the right roof, the right location, the, the, the wherewithal to do it, uh, the finances and so on. So one of the um, types of rates, the general rate structure that's been implemented in a few jurisdictions, not many, are something called three-part rates. And that kind of rate structure has an energy component, so the variable portion, the more you consume, the more you pay, and that's directly related to the cost of producing the energy. And then a demand component, which is related to your call on distribution and transmission and generation assets. So it's the capacity component, it's the fixed component of those assets which is not avoidable in the short term, but is avoidable in the long term. And then there's a, usually a fixed component which consists of the metering, billing, and customer care, and the other parts of what the, what the uh, local distribution company charges for. Uh, these rates follow something called the bond, by, bond bright principles, which have been around for a long time. Uh, and pr they promote economic efficiency. They line up customer choice with price. They, produce equity, so if customers, customers don't shift their usage and, 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 the, and the cost falls on another customer, if they actually avoid a cost when they take an action. 
and they uh, produce revenue adequacy because the, the, the LDC and the others in the province that are rate regulated receive a, 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 a rate that's consistent with their revenue, adequ with their revenue requirements. And these kinds of rates then actually, uh, w the other, I guess, important factor in uh, distributed energy is not every location is the same. A distributed resource, say a solar panel or storage or even a, ga a small gas generator, a micro turbine, depending on where it's located, it has a different effect on the grid. If it's located in a place where there's a, a s small demand, where there's a large demand for uh, additional re distribution resources, it can reduce that. If it's located in a place where the, sub, the, the substation can't handle a flow out, it can increase the actual cost. Uh, so I will uh, leave it at that and turn it over to Indy. We're now going to turn to the question of how LDCs think about rates in an era in which uh, DER is being talked about. And just, just by way of um, preliminary remark. Remember, we're talking about, the first panel talked about essentially central planning, which is that the government, the OEB, the IESO, uh, get together to talk about how uh, the new energy framework should look um, in terms of, for example, where DER should be located and how it should be priced. We also have the additional factor involved which is that individual consumers, Conrad Yakubuski in the example, um, want to get off the grid. They want to reduce the cost to them of electricity. So that's another factor. And then we have a third factor, which is the economic component of the developers who are uh, developing technologies and want to sell them and get a reasonable return. So all of those factors are at work. Ira has addressed how one rate structure proponent uh, idea uh, can deal with them. But Indy um, and Caleb, how does the LDC approach this? What factors does it have to consider? Thanks, Robert, and good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here representing Electra Utilities. For my remarks, I'm going to uh, touch on perhaps um, a key example about which Electra is uh, quite excited. It seems like lately the integration of DER has been all that most people are talking about. However, Electra's predecessor utilities have been involved in the opportunities and challenges that this provides for the past couple of years. And I'll come back to that in just a moment. We're fortunate to have some practical experience in this area, but we're very much in an exploratory stage. We're keen to work with our partners in the sector to determine the best way to manage this trend. And that ties back into the regulator and how we integrate rate making as it relates to DER. Electra's perspective on this issue is informed by our powerhouse pilot and feasibility study. For those of you that aren't familiar with it, in 2015, in response to the changing sector and from what we were hearing from our customers, the former power stream began exploring DER technologies through pilots, including one which we call powerhouse. The goal of the pilot was to help PowerStream determine how it could design a res residential storage, solar storage solution that would provide benefits both to customers and to the grid. Uh, PowerStream partnered with Sunverge, RBI, and Savage Data Systems. Each participating customer provided $3,500 up front and pays a $20 service fee with a payback term of five years. The equipment consists of five kilowatts of rooftop solar array integrated with an 11.6 kilowatt hour lithium ion battery. At the end of the contract, five years, the, there is the opportunity to renegotiate and the customer can opt out at that time. All assets are controlled with software that allows the individual units to be aggregated into a virtual power plant to deliver large scale market services to the grid. Customers are very happy with the results so far over the first three quarters of operation, savings were $85 per month, and total customer savings over $15,400. We've displaced 80,000 kilowatt hours of grid energy. 
One of the best pieces of feedback that we received recently was following a power outage when a participating customer let us know that because of Powerhouse, the family was able to give its children warm baths and cold beers to the parents. Certainly a mutually beneficial outcome. After this, Electra has now undertaken a feasibility study in conjunction with the ISO. The feasibility study, study outcomes include that Powerhouse can feasibly and meaningfully uh, apply the uptake of 30,000 units and 140 megawatts of dependable capacity. Powerhouse could defer two years of local transmission and distribution investment by the late 2020 timeframe. And it's provided a cumulative net benefit of the proposed Powerhouse expansion. In conjunction with the IASO, their market operations groups and power system planning have also benefited with the key learnings thus far. We're now at the point where quantifying the benefits of utility-managed DER requires a similar collaboration with stakeholders, and this is exactly where the confluence to rate making evolves. It needs to involve the, our regulator, the Ontario Energy Board. It'll allow us to determine the regulatory framework needed to capture the benefit streams that we've already identified, and to have, uh, it'll give us the ability to facilitate maximizing the potential of DER. Electra believes that rate making has to be economically efficient and that the cost of infrastructure should reasonably be attributed to the recipient of its benefits. This obviously gets a lot tougher when we consider DER, especially as we move up to mass deployment. I think we can agree that there is a business case to be made for rate basing of DER when it's in front of the meter and the benefits are accruing to multiple customers. This is especially true in the event where the DER is being used to address a constrained area on the grid. In this case, we believe that the utility is uniquely positioned to own and operate these assets for the following reasons. We have the expertise to manage siting for DER, we manage the flow of power, and we're best positioned to identify the constraints and how to address them. We're motivated to use DER strategically to optimize our existing assets. We have a frontline relationship with our customers and a good sense of their preferences. And we have an obligation to our customers to ensure that infrastructure they've spent years investing in does not result in stranded assets that society ultimately has to pay for. The best way to do this is for the utility to own and operate the new assets that displace the old. However, as I said, that's easy when it's in front of the meter. It gets more complicated when we consider DER behind the meter in the residential context. Increasingly, we're seeing the old line of demarcation for the utility and the customer's meter getting more and more blurred. At the end of the day, we want to meet the individual needs of our customers, and we need to carefully manage the integration of DER so that we don't unnecessarily increase societal costs. Thank you. Caleb? Well, thanks very much, and uh, I hope to build on uh, a number of Indy's comments. Um, I'd like to start just by talking a little bit about perhaps the pacing of, uh, of these issues, rate making issues, and start with an observation that I think a lot of what's um, uh, been responsible for creating this new dialogue is, is what's going on in New York with uh, renewing the energy vision down there. And um, my, my observation with, with everything, and I'm sure we'll get into the, uh, some of that uh, as we go through the next hour or so. Um, that's a really deliberate approach on behalf of uh, the governor and, and the regulator down there to start to question the full, uh, the business model of the utility. And I know there's a, another a session coming up on that issue. Um, but really wanted to make a, a comment that um, this was, uh, the move to change the business model really uh, is a precondition for rate making reforms. Uh, and I think that has to do with the facts and circumstances that New York finds itself in. Um, I'd like to make an argument today that we can afford to take a more incremental approach in Ontario with respect to uh, rate making. Um, we've done a lot in the province over the last decade, decade and, and a half to address some of the drivers that are pushing reform in New York. Uh, for example, we're in a very strong supply position uh, as the OPO uh, illustrated. Uh, the first tranche of, of renewable contracts don't come up until approximately 2023. Uh, we also have uh, deep, deep decarbonization within our uh, generation mix already, 80% uh, reductions over the last decade in, in greenhouse gas emissions from our sector. And we already have a transparent pricing mechanism for, for carbon through uh, cap and trade that applies to 
uh, the majority of, uh, of Ontario's economy. So I really want to make the case that we don't need to be on the bleeding edge of, of this issue. I think we can afford to uh, take a look at what's happening in New York, in California, and other jurisdictions um, before we make a strong play uh, for uh, DERs in a, in a really broad scope and scale. Um, where I think we can pretty easily start and uh, a, an application that doesn't necessarily require uh, full-scale reconsideration of the utility business model is in uh, non-wires alternatives. Um, as Indy mentioned, utilities are in a really good position to understand where uh, strong value propositions can be made for putting DERs on the grid. Um, and and uh, a really good example of that that Toronto Hydro has been involved in is our uh, Cecil TS local DR project. Uh, our Cecil station serves a uh, swath of area that's just west of here in and around uh, the University of Toronto. And uh, we're using CDM technologies to defer significant investment that would otherwise be required uh, at that transmission station. Uh, we observed that, that, uh, that station um, uh, is, is a really good uh, candidate for DR. Uh, about 50 to 100 hours uh, of the low duration curve are really the, the critical amount, so it's a relatively short period of time. And investments in, in distributed, um, sorry, in demand response uh, can really help uh, get that, uh, uh, that, those nine megawatts that uh, we would require uh, in a really cost effective way. Um, we can spend about $9 million to defer about $30 million worth of uh, necessary investment at that station. And uh, the great thing about that story, of course, is that uh, there are values, uh, value, uh, value stacks that return to customers all the way up and down the bill with, with one exception, and it's, it's the utility. Um, we're obviously in a, in a model, a cost of service uh, model, where um, we, uh, we make a return on, on our rate base, and so it's difficult to prioritize those sorts of projects in an environment where there isn't uh, an appropriate incentive or significant enough incentive uh, to do uh, those sorts of interventions and attract the value throughout the rest of, of the bill. Um, so in our 2015 rate case, uh, we proposed to do this pilot and simply be, be kept whole. Um, that was really just a stopgap mechanism, and I think there's lots to be discussed around what a more appropriate treatment would be for that sort of investment. Um, we look to the Brooklyn Queens demand, res demand response project as a, a good starting point um, where the, the rate making framework there was rate basing of the uh, demand response investments, um, a fairly good, uh, or, or I guess an appropriate depreciation timeline. Uh, and then there was 100 basis points of incentive uh, ROE available for meeting certain outcomes. Um, we see in, in New York that they've moved that framework one step further, removed the 100 basis points incentive and put in a benefit sharing model that um, uh, we look to and really interested to see what new kinds of projects that are akin to our Cecil project come through and, and how, that, um, how that, those ultimately shape up. So uh, really quickly in conclusion, you know, are non-wires alternatives the be-all and end-all? I would say absolutely not. Uh, what I think they are is a really good uh, first step. Uh, get everyone used, including utilities and, and customers, used to uh, looking for alternative uh, uh, interventions to conventional ones. Um, and, and get those out and, and understood. And, and I think um, uh, there's, there's good reasons to do it. I think it's relatively low risk. Uh, and and the, the value proposition that, uh, that they present, I think, is really positive. Thanks, Gail. We're now going to turn to Jeff Osborne, who will speak to us about the perspective on this uh, from the developer. Better late than never. Um, so yeah, thank you very much for having me today. I really appreciate it, and I apologize for my tardiness. Um, some great comments earlier, and I hope I'll build on some of those ideas. Um, I did hope to have a slide presentation, and I don't think we've got that set up, so I'll just describe some of my pretty graphs that I was hoping to show. Um, <laughs> but I just wanted to frame my presentation first with a quote that I really like. Um, that's, if Alexander Graham Bell returned to Earth today, the progress in telecom over the last 125 years would be mystifying. If Thomas Edison came back today, not only would he recognize our electricity system, he could probably fix it when problems arise. <laughs> and so I think that's a nice way to, to start the presentation from a developer's pers perspective. 
Um, and so for those that aren't aware, so Enerstore, we're an uh, energy storage infrastructure developer uh, pursuing a number of innovative projects. We're Toronto-based, but we're pursuing projects across Canada, in Europe, and in uh, the Caribbean as well. But we're primarily focused on energy storage, although we do do renewables as well, um, and always trying to find ways that DER can expand our portfolio. So um, one of the slides that I'd wanted to show was actually a Moat, um, Moat sort of slide that was, it's really great uh, description of basically the past the electricity system, which is a you know, very simple system. And then they've got a, a DER filled graph, uh, so to speak, with you know, a number of different opportunities for DER across the supply chain. And I, I saw it and I thought it was great because it really showed all of these new opportunities across the supply chain, everything from generation, transmission, distribution uh, to end use. And uh, you know, when we say DER, there are so many different opportunities to look at. And so I, guess, I think that's sort of how we take the approach in our stores. We look at customer first focus. What's, what's the service that the customer needs? Then we say, what's the technology that can best deliver um, service at the, at the appropriate cost for that customer? So um, I think the big question is, with DERs coming online, is this a big challenge or is it an opportunity? And I think companies or utilities that see it as an opportunity are going to be successful long term. And you know, we've got two utilities here that are already seeing uh, the, the future and, and looking forward. So I think um, you know, that's, that's the type of progressive thinking we need. Um, a few of the things I'd like to touch on are just you know, highlight some new business models and opportunities for DER. Um, focus on energy storage, obviously, given that's what we do and what we're most familiar with. Um, talk about the increasing role of the private sector and IPPs and developers. Um, talk about some of the exciting product development over the last few years in the DER space and discuss some alternative solutions to traditional infrastructure challenges. Um, so I think one of the big things too is, is talking about how we better utilize our existing infrastructure. I think that's key um, and I think DER is essential to that. So I touched on before um, DER helping across the system from generation down to end use consumption. Uh, and I think DERs offer a type of flexibility that we haven't seen before, type of new performance in a lot of ways that we haven't seen before in the system. And try to uh, understand how to integrate those resources is a challenge, um, but we're only going to be able to do that through exploration and, and testing and developing these types of systems. Um, but I think as you locate solutions closer to the customer, you give the customer more control. And I think what's really exciting is we're starting to see customers take more leadership on their own energy um, and empowering themselves to have more decision making on their own energy. Um, I think you know opportunities in Ontario, for example, with respect to the market renewal and thinking about how you know, maybe we move away from just single source procurements and think about how if we deploy an asset and it can do seven different things, how do we quantify and extract all those values? Um, and it's a bit of a double-edged double sword because if you're stacking these value streams, which we always talk about with storage, it means you sometimes have multiple customers that you have to get money from, um, which can make things a bit difficult. But, um, you know, I think that's, that's one of the ch exciting challenges about storage. So. Uh, one, one report that I just want to talk to briefly is, it's a McKinsey report called How to Save a Trillion Dollars a Year. And they basically said, globally, we can save a trillion dollars a year in infrastructure by doing the following three things. Improving project selection and optimizing infrastructure portfolios, streamlining delivery, and making the most out of existing infrastructure assets. And where that ties in with CDM, specifically that last point, is they believe, or I guess their analysis concluded that Internationally, we could save $400 billion a year by better utilizing the existing infrastructure we have with CDM. Um, governments need to make, uh, sorry, I'll just read out here. Governments need to make more aggressive use of tools that allow them to manage demand. Advances in technology are broadening the range and improving the effectiveness of such demand management approaches. To fully capture the potential of demand management, governments need to take a comprehensive uh, approach and use all available tools. So with respect to effective infrastructure planning and VFM analysis, I mean, I think my personal view, and I would say our company's view too, is that we need to take a broader approach that looks at both economic and social values. And you know, trying to quantify the social values can be more difficult, but with carbon pricing and other, other related uh, mechanisms, we can, we can start to do that more effectively. But I'd say it's essential to have economic and social value uh, analysis completed. Let's move this a bit closer. Um, and so I think a more thorough cost-benefit analysis is, is needed, and it needs to be a bigger part of our regional energy planning, uh, but we need to take a longer-term approach uh, with our energy planning as well. Um, so with respect to storage, and I would have had a slide on this, but it's just, I think the, the, some of the key value streams we see for storage in Ontario uh, relate to ancillary services, transmission and distribution asset deferral, which is like the CECL project just mentioned, renewables and EV integration, backup power, and bulk storage. And as I sort of touched on, you know, the great thing about storage is it can do all these things. The challenging thing about storage is it can do all these things and you know, not, oftentimes 
one of the services alone cannot pay for the asset, but when you start to stack them, you can make that business case more justifiable. Uh, and I think what's exciting about storage specifically is that it's both load and generation. Um, you know, I, I think uh, that's, that's a new type of flexibility we haven't seen in the past, and I see some, some friends from the OEB here, and, and I'll, I'll just call them out in a, in a good way, because when we deployed our first grid-scale energy storage asset, I believe it was the first one connected on, in Ontario, um, I remember reading the first, we had to fill out a generation license, and we complained and said, well, it's both load and generation, you can only tick one of the boxes. So I think the OEB was progressive and said, you know, that's a good point, let's make a new license for energy storage resources. And I think the only way we're going to move forward on the regulatory front is by deploying these assets, identifying these issues, even though they may seem subtle or small, but through actually deploying and operating these assets. Um, but yeah, as I mentioned, storage, load and generation. Um, it's a new type of flexibility and oftentimes higher performance uh, resources than we've seen in the past. And so as we try and monetize uh, the business case for storage and build the business case, you know, we, we've, got, we, we've talked about how we've got a Swiss Army knife here that can do eight different things. Um, but what we need to see is, um, what we need to see is, you know, increased uh, or, or actually quantification of the value streams so that we can add them up, make the business case and deploy those assets. So in terms of, I just see I have a minute left so I'll get through my last slides here. but. Uh, in terms of barriers to DER innovation, I think some of the things we like to talk to are you know, technology development. Prices are dropping immensely. In the battery space, we've seen prices drop 50% in the last three years, and I think we're going to continue to see that trend uh, much in the same way the solar industry and uh, saw pricing decrease. And from a regulatory standpoint, we need to better incent innovation with, L with the LDCs. We've, we've, we've got two progressive LDCs here that are already you know, doing a lot. I think we can, as a, as a province, be doing a lot more. And I think we'd like to see that. And in terms of investment, I think that's one of the big challenges is, you know, we need to have more financeable contracts for energy storage resources and other DERs. And so that ties back with the single source procurements that, that the ISO has done in the past where how can we extract more value from these resources, create contracts that you can take to the banks um, and get financing for those projects. Um, and in terms of the four real opportunities we see for energy storage in Ontario um, and also other DERs, we work in four areas, utility scale project development. So supplying uh, ancillary services or other grid-related service to the ISO as the main customer, commercial and industrial projects, working with uh, industrial customers, automotive manufacturers, pharmaceutical companies to empower them to take more control over their own energy management, um, mostly to uh, uh, mitigate uh, global adjustment charges, which are significant, but we're building assets behind the meter at large industrial customers based on one uh, single value stream, which is really exciting, and we're seeing you know, hundreds of megawatts of opportunities across Ontario already already moved forward and we've got project signed, so we're excited about that. The last two are just remote communities and microgrids, working with progressive First Nations communities and Aboriginal communities to develop renewables plus storage to uh, increase energy security. And finally, we've got a subsidiary which is located just down the hall here called Empower Energy Solutions, which is deploying the Tesla Powerwall to customers across Canada. And the ex exciting thing about this, and I think Indy will agree, is you know it's a localized uh, benefit initially, but on an aggregated basis, if you've got 10,000 residential units and you can control them all at once, what grid-wide services can you provide as well? So there's a lot of exciting opportunity on that front as well. Um, I've got a few other points here. I think I'll just probably end it there. Um, but yeah, thank you very much for having me. I wanted to uh, start by following up. I want to posit for the panel um, two issues which, um, depending on your perspective, are either social equity issues or economic issues. And the first is, the situation of the uh, consumer who, for reasons either of choice or necessity, um, cannot uh, invest in DER. Um, and faced with the migration off the grid of substantial numbers of um, otherwise consumers, um, there is a social equity issue of who bears the residual costs. That's point number one. Point number two is the risk of stranded assets, which is that if a number, if enough people leave the grid, then all of the investments which um, Electra and the companies that formed it and Toronto Hydro have made risk being stranded. So I want the reaction of the panel to first how it is that the rate right structure addresses those issues. But secondly, I want to return to a point that Caleb made, which is that Ontario doesn't need a New York State REV-style planning process which integrates all of these considerations. 
And I guess the question that follows from that is, is doing this on a case-by-case -case basis a reasonable way to plan when there are significant risks for consumers and from utilities? I don't know where to start uh, with that, but first of all, I'd, I'd like the panel to talk their perspective on what I've called the social equity issues and how rates deal with that. I'm happy to start. Perhaps I'll go first. I think what we're seeing from our customers and certainly the discussions so far is not this notion of energy independence, but energy interdependence. There's still a, uh, a threshold, I think, where um, even those customers that are, let's call it defecting or going off the grid, still want that base or threshold through which there's still the opportunity to work back with the utility or to have the comfort, if you will, of the utility as that base threshold. So from our perspective, from Electra's perspective, what we're seeing from customers is that migration towards interdependence as opposed to solely being a utility customer or solely being 100% off-grid. I think to, the, to an extent that speaks to the social equity uh, issue and the notion of stranded, at, well, at least the social equity issue, because it naturally lays in a framework where uh, and an evolving framework with the regulator on how do you value that so that the remainder of customers aren't left, as you say, holding the bag, Robert. Uh, there must, there, in, in our view, there therefore needs to be a contribution from those customers as well. Um, on the notion of stranded assets, uh, which was your second point, um, I think that we need to be looking at how to capture the value that DERs provide and then properly integrating their deployment. Uh, utilities currently are faced with distribution system plans. It's a requirement of our regulatory filings with the OEB, at least in Ontario, and that's a five-year planning outlook. But the DERs now provide us with an additional tool in our toolbox, if you will. We don't need to just think of ourselves as poles and wires companies. We need to have the opportunity to um, leverage the assets, whether they are poles and wires, or be they uh, DERs, such that we don't end up with stranded assets and so that the five-year planning cycle and the distribution system plans address all of the elements that we can, uh, that we can integrate for system planning and for deployment. Uh, maybe I'll stop there and let my, pan my fellow panelists respond before we get into your rev question. Well, well just before you go, Indy, I just, it seems to me implicit in that, and, and please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, Implicit in that is the notion that there has to be a very substantial degree of central planning and control in all of this. And is that not antithetical to the notion of a competitive market-driven solution to these problems where the developers say, we've got a better, um, sorry, most trap, um, and to what extent should the planning process protect the utilities? Because that seems to me implicit in what you're saying. As I say, correct me if I'm wrong. So what I would say is that as it is, we uh, naturally plan for our system or our part of the grid. We look at, we evaluate on an ongoing basis those areas that are system constrained and what the best ways are in which to address those constraints. Um, if we're limited to the wires and poles, which uh, to to Jeff's earlier point, like clearly we haven't come a long way, baby, and uh, uh, Edison would see the same thing that he saw 100 years ago. Um, realistically, we need to be able to look at our region and then plan appropriately, and as I was indicating about the powerhouse solution, it's putting off uh, other transmission and distribution investment by several years. So I would say that it doesn't necessarily hearken to central planning but it requires that utilities take a broad-based approach, which we're required to do in any event, and that our customers want us to do. And from a competitive standpoint, you know, do I have a better, do they have a better mousetrap? They, they may have another mousetrap, but whether their deployment through them is necessarily better or to the exclusion of a utility, I think that competition can happen at the utility level as well. Okay, I'm sorry I interrupted Caleb, you were going to yeah, no, I'll just uh, pick up on that. I think, um, thank you. Um, 
you know, on, on, on the point about planning, I think it's, uh, it's important to note that there are different planning cycles in Ontario. Uh, we've got the macro provincial planning process that is a far longer horizon, a 20 year horizon, uh, whereas distribution system plans are five years. And so there's an opportunity for LDCs to continue to uh, evolve those five year plans in the face of challenges that are either uh, identified in the in a 20-year uh, provincial plan or that you know through their uh, updating cycle every three or four years uh, come into focus as well so it's it's almost like there's a, a dialogue I would say uh, between our plans regional plans and uh, provincial planning cycles and on the equity issues Caleb that I raised uh, no I think uh, uh, Indy talked about them I think uh, perfectly fine um, on the uh, the stranded assets issue, I mean, it's 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 not something that we foresee as being a pressing matter. And again, in our next five-year cycle, um, it's more of a theoretical argument right now, but certainly something that uh, we keep our eye on, and that I think our sector needs to keep an eye on as well. If we see trends starting to uh, trigger and and hit a, a tipping point, I don't think it'll be a linear relationship. Sorry, and just let me uh, apologize again for intruding, but uh, when you reach the tipping point. Who protects you? It's a it's a really interesting question, and you know I don't have a, a single answer. I think it's uh, it's going to be a, a dialogue between customers, between utilities, between their shareholders, between the province. Um, I, I can't imagine there would be a tolerance for a sector to just crumble uh, beneath its feet for for an issue like stranded assets, significant though it may be. It, it'll require a dialogue between all of those four actors. Ira? I was going to say on, 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 the, on the equity issue, it sounds like the projects that both Electra and Toronto Hydro have been engaging in don't increase customer costs. They reduce customer costs. Correct. They're not, um, they're, they're, they're planned. You found locations. And I think that's part of the message coming out of New York. Uh, initially, New York seemed like the Wild West. You know, uh, distribution LMPs uh, was supposed to incent developers to decide what to do, and as they've moved away from that somewhat, now they kind of distilled the principles to, to the fact that location matters, and the California utilities are moving in that direction too. So it could be, I think, behind the meter, in front of the meter, but it, there has to be a signal, a price signal, something locational about what to do, how much, and where. And I, one other thing I just mentioned at this point, uh, Jeff, you talk about the durs. I mean, durs come in different flavors. There's storage. It's controllable. It's, you say, it's very controllable. It's very fast. It, it acts as a load, too. Uh, rooftop solar is trickier, and you can't, you can count on it up to a point, and it imposes other costs on the system. And I think the ISO has limited visibility into that, so they're seeing more net load fluctuations, and that results in additional uh, ancillary service costs. From the developer's perspective? So correct me if I'm wrong, but I was added to this panel to bring a different perspective, I think, and disagree with everyone, right? Absolutely. Um, <laughs> no, I actually, I think the, the great comments, and I, I agree with many of them. I mean, the, fa the idea of pri needing price Don't signals. Don't be tiresome that way. You're not supposed to agree with them. <laughs> <laughs> I think the price signals piece is absolutely essential. I could not agree more on that. Uh, I'll try and answer your questions. I wrote down a few points here that I just want to touch on. But I think the key thing is we need to incent better incent the LDCs to pursue DER resources. And as, uh, as we've said, we've, we've got some examples here. I think there's a lot more opportunity that we can be chasing down. But I know, you know through my own per, uh, personal experience, getting some of those DERs rate-based can be, particularly storage, has been very difficult up until just recently. Um, so I think as, as a, you know, from a regulatory standpoint, we need to find a way that better incents the LDCs. I think um, from a community investment standpoint, I just want to call out two different, um, two different opportunities. So, Although it's not through the rates, there's a company called CoPower, which is a really exciting Canadian company that's allowing retail customers to invest in uh, rooftop solar or commercial solar or energy efficiency projects through um, green energy bonds. So you just put up $5,000 and you get a five-year, 5% 5 guaranteed return, um, and they aggregate all those funds to invest in the project. So I think that's one exciting opportunity that I'd like to see more of personally. Um, and then another one um, from a community investment standpoint is, you know, we're pursuing, as I mentioned, um, indigenous projects where it's renewables plus, uh, or renewables plus storage in those communities. And we, we do, you know, on an equity standpoint, we make sure that the community has at least a 30% equity uh, ownership in those projects. But I think those types of community ownership opportunities need to be explored, and they haven't been enough to date. 
Um, so I'd like to see more of that. And in terms of the stranded assets issue, uh, I kind of see it as, well, what's, that, what's the residual value? What can we, what, what, you know, that's still infrastructure that's built. How can we still repurpose it or re reutilize it for something else? I think we need to figure out a way to do that more effectively because I think that, you know, we've got, we've got the, the poles and wires built, so we might as well use them. Um, and then on the piece of the death spiral, uh, the utility death spiral, I actually see it as a survival of the fittest utility type situation where, you know, the utilities that see the opportunity are going to, they're going to pursue it and they're going to be successful. And I, I personally believe that the utilities are not just going to disappear. I think we're just going to see an amalgamation of uh, utilities led by the most progressive ones. And uh, I think the utilities are best suited to uh, monetize all of those different value streams we talked about before. So when I mentioned, you know, and using the powerhouse project or the Empower Solutions Tesla Powerwall um, system, you know, you've got local benefits to a customer, but on an aggregated basis, you can aggregate those services to provide uh, value to the grid as well. And I think the utilities are really in the best position to identify and quantify all those services. Uh, just before we turn the, uh, it over to questions from the floor, and I'm reminded by Richard that there are mics if people want to, uh, to use them in addition to the written questions. Um, the, I want to get back to this notion of uh, central planning and control. And before I do that, though, I want to ask about the, uh, uh, the impact all of you see of the, I won't editorialize, the intrusion of the Ontario government into the pricing mechanism. Um, I guess starting with you, Jeff, what's the impact of a somewhere between 17 and 25 percent reduction in rates for certain categories of consumers? Does it, does it <laughs> delay this entire process? Does it make it irrelevant in some fashion? I would say more generally in taking a step back and, and tying in with an earlier comment on price signals being essential. I think we need the price we pay for electricity to reflect the actual cost of the system. And the more and more we, we break those apart, um, the more difficult it is for you know, new innovative solutions to take hold. So do I take it from that that the fair hydro plan is going to have an adverse impact? I think that it could, yeah. Okay. Can you speculate as to the nature and extent of the adverse impact? To the extent of the impact, sorry? Is that yeah. what you said? I mean, it's difficult to say. I would just, I, you know, for, I can speak from our, from our company's perspective, and I think um, in, some, in some respects, uh, you know, with, with some of our different business lines, as I mentioned, with the commercial and industrial customers, I think that by, um, you know, you know, helping to, and I guess it's more for residential customers, but just generally, if, if I'd, I'd kind of like to see rates continue to increase because it will force people, you know, to pursue different solutions. Okay. Caleb? It's a delicate one to, uh, to step into. I'll try to uh, do my best to avoid the, uh, the fissures. That, oh, why? Uh, why? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'll, I'll just say that the Fair Hydro Plan, that the duration of the relief is, is four years, and we're talking about uh, projects and solutions that uh, have uh, much longer lives than that. And so to the extent that there, you know, there's a marginal impact through the reduction in rates, I mean, we're talking about uh, at least uh, retail rates going back to where they were roughly in 2013. Um, so it's not like we're, we're uh, totally uh, changing the, the discussion or the context. I, I think uh, looking at the horizon where we, where distributed energy resources are more likely to really uh, pick up. It's going to, uh, it's a different, it's a different time scale than, than the four year relief. So I, I you know, my opinion is that uh, we won't see, uh, it won't have a huge impact, but um, you know, it's really, again, probably a question best left for, for developers. Perhaps just to add to that, again, avoiding any landmines. I think it, at worst, the Fair Hydro Plan has delayed DER deployment. But at the end of the day, the investments that we're making in the grid, the ongoing uh, renewal of our infrastructure, those costs aren't going away. And uh, often, as I, as I talked about in the powerhouse solution where we were dealing with uh, constraints, and in fact, it's constraints in Markham uh, that the powerhouse solution was initially deployed to try and address, those aren't going away either. And so looking at uh, different solutions, varied solutions to wires and poles. The opportunity increases. The Fair Hydro Plan obviously undoes some of the uh, price signals that were otherwise working in favor of DER or the grid parity uh, opportunity that seemed to quickly be evolving. 
but I, I would go back to my first point that at worst it's delayed it, but uh, not removed it altogether. Okay. Ira? Obviously, it lowers the price uh, signal, so it has to delay it. But the but the cost is, as Jeff said, solar is coming down, uh, storage is coming down dramatically, so it may not be that much of an impact. A question has been, uh, actually a couple of questions from the floor, which I'll pose to the panel, which is that we've, uh, in talking about what Ontario has done over the past 15 years in terms of encouraging um, getting off coal, uh, encouraging uh, renewable energy, uh, Ontario has also has invested and continues to invest a very substantial amount in baseload generation from nuclear facilities. What is, in their view of the panelists, the relationship between the development of DER and maintaining the economic integrity of the investments in uh, baseload generation? Sure, I'll, I'll take a start. I, I, I don't know if I have a, a direct response to that question. I would say, you know, going back to my opening statement that, you know, regardless of what you're doing on the generation side, we're going to continue to have constraints at very specific uh, points in our system and, and the need to um, deal with those uh, circumstances in a cost-effective manner, I think, is where uh, DERs pose the greatest value, at least at this specific moment in time. So, you know, whether you are uh, investing in, in base load generation for, uh, for nuclear or, or something else, at least in that very specific context, um, I, I don't see it as being uh, hugely impactful. Andy? I'll go back to my... I'll go back to my earlier point about where we're seeing consumer preference to be towards interdependence. And so I think it speaks to the point that Caleb just made, which is that uh, you still require, at this point, we still require the investment. We aren't seeing such a huge evolution that we're immediately at that death spiral of utilities out, uh, DER is completely 100% in, and that we don't need those investments at all. So. Um, they, they are investments that, we've, that, that the province has been making over the past several years. I think their need, their need will continue for the foreseeable future. Herbert? Well, the, I don't know the, I don't recall the, the dollar amount for the Darlington refurbishment, but that's keeping, you know, I'm not saying it's bad because it's zero carbon and I don't, uh, it's a zero carbon source that probably couldn't be replaced. I certainly don't think Durs could replace uh, that much uh, anywhere near that much uh, zero carbon uh, electricity. So in that regard, it's good. It's part of the plan to keep and redu further reduce um, emissions. But it, it does kind of crowd out DERS. It kind of damps real price signals in the market. It keeps that heavy base load in place and, and continues the surplus base load problem. Uh, Jeff, it's very disconcerting to see you at the end of this panel nodding in agreement. Your function is never to agree with anything. <laughs> well, I mean, I would just say it's a sort of centralized versus decentralized question, in my opinion, and I don't think it's one or the other. I think it's both. We're going to continue to see both, and I think we are seeing opportunities now where in the past we would have just pursued a traditional infrastructure centralized project to fix a traditional, pro uh, uh, a traditional problem, and today we're seeing you know, opportunities in Ontario and in California and other places where, you know, a centralized project is being delayed or avoided altogether through DER. So I, I don't see it as one or the other. I think it's always going to be both. One of the solutions in the, certainly in the early days of renewables was uh, net metering. And um, one of the points that the ISO has made is that we have an oversupply of electricity and arguably the people who install DER uh, don't have a market for it. So they would be installing it arguably principally for their own benefits, whether it's uh, reliability or reduction in their own cost. To what extent, uh, in the view of the panel, will, um, does net metering continue to be relevant in light of our oversupply? And if so, what impact uh, will the oversupply have on the development of this market? I mean, I'll just I'll say very quickly, I think net metering will play a role um, in DER development, I think. And, you know, I may be sounding like a broken record. I just, I see DER as so broad and covering across the entire supply chain, everything from transmission, uh, distribution, uh, jet back to generation, end use consumption. And I think net metering will have an impact. Um, it's one of several 
um, avenues to deploy DER. Is it, it's in no way, you know, the only one. I think, you know, it's, it's just one other opportunity for, for the development of DER resources. I think uh, net metering, it, it's an interesting question. I mean, uh, you know, going back to, to my original thesis, which is you need to think about the actual uh, construct that we currently have in our province and not just look to uh, other jurisdictions. You know, I think um, we're obviously coming to a point where fit and microfit are starting to, uh, are, are, are going to be expiring, and so something needs to take its place. At the same time, uh, there are limitations in what net metering can do with, uh, at least from a distributor's perspective, because it doesn't contain that locational element of pricing. And, you know, barring uh, reforms that, that do incorporate that, it, it, um, it's a bit of a blunt instrument. And, uh, you know, I, you, I think it is one, one example where, where New York is starting to have that, that right kind of conversation with their value of DER proceeding and starting to look at, at the value stack. I think uh, we can afford to uh, wait on that one. I think, uh, you know, it's very clear that the ministry is moving ahead with, uh, well, they filed changes to the net metering regulation already. Um, there's discussions on whether there will be further reforms. So I think it, it, we have a window to think about how to do the valuation in the right way to make it uh, a more effective paradigm for us. And, and that's why I think we can you know, start with the non-wires alternatives and, and take the time to get that one right. I think maybe just to add, um, we're seeing far more uh, prevalence of consumers opting for choice and opting, uh, being educated and having the opportunity to make those choices. So to say that net metering is irrelevant, I, I wouldn't take that away from consumers, though I see the ISO's, uh, I can understand the ISO's position on the value from their perspective. Uh, that being said, from a broader utility and uh, overall system planning perspective, as has been articulated by my peers, it doesn't solve many of our problems when we look at uh, broader system planning and system constraints. And so while, uh, while it's one option, it, it certainly doesn't solve all of the problems that we're trying to address. Uh -huh. I, I agree with that. With that, pretty much with everyone, it's a very, it's a blunt instrument. It made uh, it made it's it's an old method. It made a lot of sense uh, when solar and DERS were of limited penetration. But I think it's you and Ontario have the opportunity to think now about better ways of doing things going forward. And there's a, there's a lot of activity around to learn from. Maybe if I can just add one point to that. Um, it, it occurs to me that net metering has taken some time to see its, uh, you know, at, come to the fore at the ministry level, as well as uh, now there's an OEB proceeding on the same. Um, my hope would be that uh, as the DER question is evolving, and evolve, it seems to me evolving more rapidly as grid parity and the cost of solutions is dropping, that perhaps there will be a, a greater initiative uh, though, as Caleb has indicated, uh, looking at other jurisdictions, but still, I think there, this is one of those that Ontario needs to take seriously from a uh, multi-partner perspective, uh, the regulated entities, the competitive resources, and the regulator as well. And I, I would hate to see this one languish, um, where I think net metering has kind of lagged behind in terms of uh, the confluence of regulation and um, proceedings at the OEB. Uh, at various points, uh, each of you have mentioned uh, the concept of value, and I, I'm going to assume that means value to the system of DER. Um, and as you look forward to the increasing uh, deployment of DER, whether as a matter of market-driven uh, from a consumer perspective or the government or the LDCs trying to uh, monitor, control it, organize it, um, should we have a province-wide principled basis upon which we determine the value to the system? And if so, who makes that determination? Ira? An overall value, of, a way of valuing DERS, which is to um, the system, to yes. the system right? Uh, then the, I guess the, the questions that arise are, there are the uh, obvious, um, measurable value of the energy, the value of deferred or, 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 or 
assets, transmission, distribution, generation, and then there are externalities, which I think start to get to be, um, can be very controversial because some of that's already presumably priced in through the WCI. So I, I think it's an important thing to think about because that can also inform the rate structure and I, with a, uh, an appropriate rate structure could, could monetize those values from the customer's point of view and the system point of view? Indy? Um, I do think that there needs to be a common valuation metric. Um, the sources of value include benefit to distribution and transmission. There's environmental benefits. I would hate to see this dealt with on a pilot by pilot basis. Um, you know, it, we end up then very much in a hodgepodge of uh, what the appropriate outcome for the system, for, con uh, for consumers, and from a regulator's perspective, uh, what, the right, what the right outcome should be. I do think that you need to take a broader-based a broader approach and recognize that there is a societal benefit and a benefit not just to the one consumer that uh, wants the DER, but potentially, and depending on where uh, in front of or behind the meter, of course, uh, where that solution lies. I think the, the value stack is going to, and I, I agree with, uh, with my colleagues here, I, I think uh, you know, the one thing about the value stack is that it's going to continue to change as technology changes, as markets change. You know, for example, if we were to, if the exercise for this group today was to come up with a value stack, uh, it would need to be reformed within you know, a short period of time as, as capacity markets uh, come to Ontario through, uh, through the ISO wholesale market uh, reform. So, you know, it's going to be, again, one of these things where we need to constantly reevaluate what that value stack is on the best data and, and the uh, institutions that we have uh, uh, at, at that time. Who's the we, Gil? I think... Uh, to it, avoid, sorry, to avoid the circumstance that Indy just talked about, which is you can't do it on a case-by-case -case basis randomly across the province. Who's the we? Uh, I, I don't th actually. I don't think it needs to. There, it, there needs to be a hard and fast answer there. I think uh, with rate making, um, there's always going to be different opportunities for different actors to uh, to spur change. Uh, whether it's utilities through rate applications, whether it's through the regulator um, uh, taking on a consultation, or the government uh, inserting something in its long-term energy plan. I think there are different ways that we can uh, broach the subject. Okay. Jeff? I think it's a really good question and I guess I would say, you know, I, I think there needs to be some underlying base valuation for different services, but I think to say that, you know, one, you know, locating an asset in one spot where you can derive more value, where it actually does, I mean, we've seen projects that we're developing that create, it, they physically create more value for more customers um, by being located in certain areas, so I think we need to emphasize that more. and. Uh, doing it on a project on a project specific basis makes it difficult to do um, and maybe that you know we start that by you know tackling the big fish for the largest infrastructure projects maybe we spend a little bit more time thinking about what incremental value is attributed to locating it you know next to one substation versus another and um, so I, I'm very supportive of of there being a greater emphasis on trying to identify the specific value associated with a specific project uh, and I think you can only have that conversation, you know, with all stakeholders, including the community, including, you know, the regulators, including ideally the developers who are developing the projects. Um, but I, I think that, you know, we're not going to, I've personally seen too many procurements where, you know, we try and just set a baseline for locate a project anywhere in the province and we'll, we'll pay you X to provide, you know, regulation service, for example. And I think that's not being smart with our infrastructure because, uh, I've seen, as I said, a number of procurements in the past where we, you know, we're trying to go out of our way to say, well, you know, for a nominal fee, we can locate it at a specific site, you know, that's been ruled out of the RFP for, you know, whatever reason, and we can create, you know, three times more value. And I think that's, that's really essential, and we need to start being smarter with our infrastructure development. Uh, the last question I want to ask, and I guess this is, reflects, uh, with apology, the hobby horse of mine. Uh, Indy talked about the Powerhouse Project, um, and Caleb talked about the Cecil Project. It strikes me, subject to your uh, comments, that those are projects which are uniquely available to large urban centers um, with sophisticated uh, suppliers, sophisticated economic circumstances. What are the implications of the DER 
revolution, perhaps delayed by the Fair Hydro Plan. What are the implications for the literally dozens of smaller utilities and their customers across the province? Is that an issue? A, is it an issue of equity? And B, if it is, what do we do about it? Ira? I think that there, there have been projects, especially storage projects, like in the Pacific Northwest, and that have been targeted at remote locations, avoiding uh, distribution line upgrade. So I, I think it's not, I mean, I think maybe the really super high value ones are like Brooklyn, Queens, the Cecil project, but I think there are many others. It's a matter of identifying them, which has to be up to the local utility. To add, I think that um, each of these projects, while common in their dr ness if you will, is a different, and a different and varied solution as between them. So I think there's the opportunity to evaluate on a case-by-case -case basis. And enough of, and particularly over time, uh, solutions are evolving such that those smaller communities will still have and likely um, opportunities will uh, emerge for them to undertake these projects in a different uh, framework or capacity. I'll add very quickly, I think uh, if you get the rate making right, uh, the economics will speak for themselves. Okay. I think, uh, I actually believe with some of those smaller communities and jurisdictions, they're actually more incented to pursue alternative solutions faster. You know, maybe using an extreme example again, but just given what we're doing with the indigenous communities, I mean, I think um, you know, flying diesel fuel up to some of those communities, it's, it's very clearly non-economic, and so they're pushed um, to the brink very quickly and uh, need to pursue DER immediately. Um, and I think you know, that there will be a trickle-down effect, but I think you know, obviously you've got to target the low-hanging fruit first, um, but I actually believe, you know, when you look at some of the, you know, even the fringe LDCs in Ontario, I mean, they have very high demand charges, which is pushing customers to pursue uh, localized energy storage and other DER resources already. So I think, um, uh, you know, I'll be a ro broken record one more time, but DER across the supply chain is a very real thing, and, you know, we're, we're going to see a lot of uh, continued development over the coming years. I have Sean Conway looming over my shoulder, which is a terrifying prospect, but that means we're done. Well. Uh, not quite, uh, and I have to say, panel, I think you've done very well, given the Conrad Black approach of the moderator on uh, occasion. I thought... Uh, I'm not under friend, indictment anywhere, I thank mean, you very I, much. You know, some of my friends from the OEB, didn't you think that our moderator friend thought he was back at the board uh, with a bunch of witnesses that he was going to have free reign with? I thought, uh, I thought you did a very good job of, uh, of dealing with... Uh, some pretty uh, prying questions, but um, obnoxious. Uh, is the word no, no, no. I would never say that. But, but just before we do wrap up I, I, on both of these panels, one of the things that I just ask rhetorically: um, Can you imagine just dropping into this meeting if you were a small business person in Ontario, or you were just the average consumer who's got an interest, if for no other reason than she, he gets a bill every month or two about this conversation? and what it actually might mean to the extent you could understand it. Now, they would, that person, I think, every person would expect not to understand it all, but I thought, for example, there was a very interesting subtext in this panel um, about the question of location, which, for me, makes the point that we were talking about in the first panel, often the nature of the challenge and the, the issue has a great deal to do with where you are. I mean, it's hard in tomogamy to get on the, imagine being on the radio talking about the traffic report at 5 o'clock, because the traffic on Highway 11 in metropolitan tomogamy at 5 o'clock is like not what it is at the point where 403, 407, 427, 409 all converge in the northwest quadrant of the metropolitan Toronto area. So again, one of the questions for me, and I, I presume for the, for the Moet Center, as we look at trying to understand the opportunity and the challenge is, who are we talking about and where? Another question we, we didn't talk about here, and I, again, I, I will use myself as a, as a consumer, my friend McGilvery will be laughing here, but you know, I, I, like the, I like what I'm hearing about the opportunities. But I'm thinking about some other utilities, not in the energy business, with whom I, from whom I consume services. And actually what I'm discovering is 
that while the advertising flyers are really interesting and attractive, at the end of the day, it comes down to it's their system, but it's my problem. God forbid that I'm trying to f figure out this telco scheme at 11 o'clock at night when the hockey game goes, and all of a sudden something goes awry, and I have no idea how to fix it. And of course, I get on the telephone, and I might find somebody in Bangalore, India, who is going to solve my problem before sunrise. And, I, and I'm, I'm only saying that half facetiously. I think there are a lot of really interesting opportunities. I've heard the powerhouse story many times. I'm really, really attracted to that. But I would think that I'm not alone among consumers saying, boy, if I buy into that scheme, this isn't uh, a discretionary commodity. I, I can't leave this place if this system isn't working. I mean, this if the television doesn't work to hell with it. I can just walk out the door and it doesn't matter. My energy system is compromised in some technological way that I can't fix or understand. I've got a very, very different kind of problem. Um, Ira, you made a couple of very interesting points, uh, and I was thinking again about, and again, the earlier panel talked about costs and the consumer. One of the interesting things for me in this question in energy that gets lost often in these kind of conferences, there are 25% of the residential consumers of energy services for whom this is a very real, urgent, and pressing matter. They don't have the money. You know, there are a lot of blue-suited 42-year-old businessmen, usually, who talk about this because their energy costs are less than 1% of their disposable income. There's 20, 25% of the consuming public out there that could only imagine what that must be like. So to what extent when we talk about costs, and it's sort of Robert's point about equity issues, certainly policymakers very quickly find this out, that uh, there are subsets of the consuming public that react to these things very differently. And the, there is an equity issue in energy because it's a commodity that is absolutely central. You cannot be without it. We're more dependent on particularly electricity now than we were 10 years ago. And there's no sign that that's going to abate. So how do we factor into these conversations and solutions some of those often missed uh, but very important uh, factors, and I just want to thank you for taking us under the able leadership of moderator Warren uh, to a, a number of those considerations and uh, great, uh, great launch into lunch. So thank you very much, moderator panel.